Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? All right. I guess so. All right. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, like you said, my name is Nathan Arnold. I'm coming to you from the Quiot Group from UIUC. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a privilege and a, an honor to be here today to talk to you guys. And I'll be talking to you guys about some uh, interesting things you can do with quantum networks and how they, or quantum memories, and how they can help in a lot of applications for quantum networking. All right, so just before I begin, here's a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. First, I'm going to start with just talking about quantum networks and um, how they can benefit from quantum memories and the different types of quantum memories that are out there. Um, this is a pretty experimental talk, so I'll try to be uh, talk about the, the relevant experimental details when, when needed to. Um, and from there, I will talk about our short single loop memory and uh, applications of that for quantum networking. Uh, and then I'll talk about longer memories that we've developed in our, our lab. And then I'll talk about uh, the performance of our, our memories and how they compare to other state-of-the-art technologies out there. And then a summary and outlook uh, moving forward. Right, so as all you probably know, quantum networks have promised to provide some pretty impressive things, such as distributed quantum computing, quantum sensing, uh, completely secure quantum communication, which is why we're all here for uh, cryptological reasons. Um, and the process of communicating in this quantum network will be vastly different than the process of communicating in a classical network. Uh, due to the no cloning theorem, we can't clone a quantum state, so we can't use classical repeaters, which makes things really hard. Uh, so this gives rise to the need for some type of quantum repeater, which doesn't necessarily do the same thing, but um, it enables long distance quantum communication. And specifically, the way that this uh, quantum repeater will work is it will uh, swap entanglement from one, one party to another over a long distance. So there'll be a bunch of uh, repeater nodes along the way that swap entanglement so that uh, Alice and Bob on the two far ends of this, this link can share a, a common entangled state. Um, and this whole process of uh, synchronization and entanglement swapping relies very heavily on uh, this hongo mandel effect where you have to have really, really precise synchronization of your photons. Um, yeah, so this, this synchronization can be uh, bolstered significantly by making use of quantum memory technologies. And there are a bunch of different quantum memory technologies out there. Uh, some of the most common approaches to making a quantum memory are this sort of called matter memory. Effectively, all you're doing is you are taking a, uh, a single photon and you are transducing it into a atomic state of some matter ensemble, some, some matter system. It could be a single atom, could be a cloud of atoms. Uh, you're just converting the energy into this state, and when you want it, you probe it and get it back at a later time. Um, and this is this is pretty effective, but it comes with some pretty uh, huge drawbacks that are hard to overcome. Just to name a few, uh, they typically have expensive overhead because this this whole process often happens at extremely low or extremely high temperatures. So you need cryos, dilution refrigerators, or you need ovens, which don't scale very well. Ovens scale better than than cryo and dilution fridges, but still, overall, it's it's difficult to have a uh, really scalable matter-based memory. Um, also, because the photon that you're storing has to be transitioned into an atomic excitation, that means that the energy of your photon has to be the same energy as this excitation, which means you are extremely narrow bandwidth. Uh, you don't have much wiggle room in, in the bandwidth of the, the photon or the, the spectrum of the photon you're, you're storing. And this is bad because um, if you want, if you want uh, if you have a really narrow bandwidth, then that means you have to have really long photons. Um, so if, if you're trying to increase the rate of your network, if you want to have faster communication speeds, you want really short photons um, in time. And if you, the shorter the photons in time, the broader their bandwidth. So they'll have a really broad spectral range. And you want to be able, be able to store that entire photon. Um, so, so having the narrow bandwidth is a pretty uh, severe limitation of these matter-based memories. Initially, the way you, you read in and read out the photons um, uses really strong control fields, and this adds a lot of noise. So it's hard to uh, reliably re re-emit that single photon, and it's also hard to get that single photon out into a single mode fiber. Uh, because on its own, um, some sort of atom will emit a photon in a random direction, so it's uh, hard to get that into fiber. And you can sort of fix this issue by putting things into cavities, but again, it's only um, so much of an enhancement you can make with, with these cavities. So another, another approach to making a quantum memory is super simple, just you know the storage time you need, cut a fiber for that length, add it to the system, and it delays it by 
by the amount you need. And this is an um, extremely cost-effective way to store photons, uh, but unfortunately it is fundamentally limited. This is because fiber optic cables um, are at the limit of how efficient they can be. They, they will always have certain amounts of loss and dispersion. Um, and the, there are certain wavelength ranges that are ideal, specifically in the, the telecom bands, about 1300 and 1550 nanometers are the ideal cases, but still there is a uh, fundamental lower limit on uh, how much how much loss uh, you can get with this uh, or how efficient they can be. Um, additionally, they offer very few degrees of freedom in, in what they can store because your light has to abide by the single spatial mode of a single mode fiber. Um, and one last comment is that while they can be really efficient for a, cutting a single fiber and storing it in that loop, if you want any type of configurability in your storage time at all, then a, a fiber is probably not the way you want to go um, because you have to cut a bunch of fibers for a bunch of different lengths. And if you want to add switches between them, then the, uh, the switches are especially lossy. So uh, difficult to get a, a configurable system that is efficient. So this brings me to our approach. We operate in free space. And free space is great because free space has negligible attenuation of light. Um, now, how do you store light in free space? It travels really fast. It's not like a fiber where you just wrap it around a spool and it, it, it stays right there. Um, light is moving really fast all over the place all the time. So uh, one, way to, one, one approach is just to throw LIGO at it. For those of you that don't know, LIGO is just a really big interferometer that we use to detect gravity waves. Um, the arms of it are four kilometers long. So if you send a single photon down this, this uh, long corridor, there's a mirror at the end, it reflects back, you get a total of eight kilometers path length, and that is 26.6 .6 microseconds of storage time. And this is great because um, a single reflection, their mirrors are 99.999% reflectivity, so you're getting effectively all those photons back. So really, really efficient way to store photons. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty big, and we will not be able to put LIGO at every single repeater node. So um, what can we do about this? If we want to continue to store in free space, then what we can do is we can uh, have a cyclical memory, a, a switchable uh, delay line buffer effectively. Um, so you see here on this diagram on the right, uh, this is a simplified schematic of this switchable buffer that we've developed in, in our lab. Um, I'll, I'll go in depth into explaining what's happening. So on the left hand side, a photon comes in and these cubes are polarizing beam splitters. A polarizing beam splitter is just a, an optic that horizontal light will transmit, vertical light will reflect. So if a, and, and uh, the other optic in here is this Pockel cell, this cylinder right here. Uh, and this is effectively a, a wave plate that you can uh, trigger on and off really fast. So you apply voltage to this cell and there's a crystal in there that when you apply this voltage, it induces birefringence uh, while, the, while the pulse is applied and that birefringence can rotate the polarization of your light. So effectively what you can do is while light is coming in, it trans it'll transmit through the first polarizing beam splitter you can switch the polarization in this pockel cell so that it reflects off of this one, and then it'll just reflect in this in this cavity in this uh, buffer as long as you want. And then when you're done storing it, you switch the polarization back, and it'll transmit and go on its way. Uh, and this is great because this this gives you a uh, storage time that is an integer multiple of this 12.5 nanoseconds. It's a, a relatively uh, fine fine time resolution. Uh, it's pretty cost effective. It's a, a small footprint, just a small little loop um, that you can make. But the downside of this is that we are fully limited in efficiency by our uh, this optical switch, this, these polarizing beam splitters plus the pockel cell, because uh, a single re reflection off of a mirror can have greater than 99.99% reflectivity. So that's not a problem to have a few reflections. But uh, the, the switch efficiency is about 99%. So the longer we go through this, we're losing a pretty significant amount of our light. Um, so even though it's a, a pretty short storage time, 12.5 nanoseconds, there's still a lot of pretty big uh, improvements you can get with this type of technology. So I'll just talk about the applications of this short single loop uh, memory. So one, one application is that in a lot of, in pretty much every quantum networking application, you need a reliable source of single photons. Single photons are an incredibly uh, useful resource, uh, and if not a single photon, then a pair of single photons that are entangled. Um, and there are, are a few ways to create a good source. Um, one way to do this is this so-called single emitter approach where you have such a, something such as a, a quantum dot or a nitrogen vacancy where uh, it's nice, you, you push button and it emits a photon. 
Uh, and that's great because we want a deterministic source where you can push button and photon comes out. Um, but the downside of these single emitters is that the retrieval efficiency, again, is extremely low for the same reason that matter-based memories have a poor retrieval efficiency. A single emitter emitting a photon, it will emit into a random direction and you have to do a lot of uh, engineering with your cavities to promote emission into a single mode fiber. So uh, even though you push button and photon comes out, you don't necessarily always get that photon out. Um, additionally, all, all these single emitters require uh, cryogenic operation. So again, doesn't scale very well. Um, and they, they're pretty inhomogeneous in their emission spectra. Uh, quantum dots, dots, for example, vary in their engineering and their, their manufacturing. So one quantum dot, even though they're made like an hour apart from each other, will have a different emission spectra than this quantum dot. And if you really need super, super um, precise wavelengths, then this is not really acceptable. Uh, and, and nitrogen vacancies, if you have different, uh, different environmental things happening, different temperatures, they'll have different emission spectra as well. So this other, this other type of source, this pair source, um, is based on probabilistic emission. So it's not a deterministic process, which is the, the biggest downfall of these pair sources, because you see that all the other criteria are, are met very well. They have great retrieval efficiency. Um, they, they operate at room temperature, super easy to, to implement, so they scale very well and very high purity. Uh, nonetheless, in our group, we focus on this pair source, this uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion specifically. You see here on the left-hand side a, uh, a, a schematic of what down conversion is, for those that don't know. So down conversion is the process where a high energy pump photon goes through this crystal. And this crystal has this weird nonlinear property where um, a photon traveling through it has a chance to randomly convert into two photons that are entangled. And the energy of these two photons is equal to the energy of the pump. So you see in the schematic, uh, this, this green pulsed pump is entering the down conversion source and you will randomly get entangled pair out of it. So this is, this is how one, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people generate uh, entangled pairs because it's uh, super easy to implement in the lab. Um, a few, another, another drawback of this approach other than just the, the non-deterministic non non aspect is that um, you, not, you don't always get a single pair of entangled photons. You can get zero pairs uh, for when it's just probabilistic not happening. You could also get two pairs or three pairs because if your, your pump has more than one photon down at the same time, then you'll get more than one pair out. And we don't want more than one pair for uh, quantum, quantum networking purposes. So we just want single pairs. And this is uh, a hard, hard thing to overcome. Uh, so this, this equation shows the probability of emitting K photon pairs um, as a function of the pump, uh, the pump energy. So the amount of energy in a, a single pump. Um, so you see, if we, if we just set the pump energy to one, just to get it out of there, then we're, we have this simplified equation where um, if we're looking for k equals one, a single pair of photons, it's pretty easy to see that this is 25%. And that is actually the fundamental limit of your probability of emitting a single pair of photons. If you're just pumping a crystal with, uh, with, with your, your laser, then the, high, the highest probability you could ever get of having a single pair of photons is 25%. And typically, it's much worse than this. It's usually on the order of 1% or 2%. So um, this, is, this is pretty bad, because if you're trying to send photons uh, consistently then, and only have a, a few percent chance of emitting these pairs, then um, pretty fundamental limitation. So um, what we can do about this is something called time multiplexing, essentially taking your continuous time and, and discretizing it, breaking it up into discrete time bins. Uh, so you see here the same, the same schematic where we have uh, pump pulses going into our down conversion crystal. And in each of these time bins, uh, we can have an entangled pair. So uh, uh, these represent photons that are entangled at uh, these two wavelengths. And if you just look at, look at these time bins on their own, the probability of any one of these time bins having a single pair of photons is really low. Um, but in order to, we, we can make this better by grouping them together. If we group a, a bunch of time bins together, then the probability of one time bin in this group having a single pair of photons is much higher than if you were not to do this. Uh, so th this is one way we can increase the probability of having a general, general knowledge of the lo location of a single pair of photons. And what we can do with this is um, integrate our, our cyclical memory, the short uh, single loop memory, into the system to emit it at a 
consistent time. So for example, what we can do is uh, we can use one of the photons to go to a detector and herald the presence of the other. So this yellow photon goes to a detector and tells a computer, hey, there's another photon coming, be ready. And this photon we will send to our memory. And uh, you see that it's in the, the first time bin to the right. Uh, so if we want our photons in this time bin, then all we have to do is shuffle it back one time in this cycle, and we have a photon emitted in that time bin. And same thing for the other one. If it's in the fourth time bin, then all we have to do is shuffle it back three cycles in this, in this delay, and it, again, will come out at that same last time bin. So this is a way for us to uh, split up our space and, and um, ensure that we can have a reliable source of single photons at a consistent rate rather than just a random production of these photons. Uh, so you see here on the left hand side we have a, a plot of the single photon probability as a function of the time bins that you're multiplexing, um, how many you're bunching together. So you can see that we actually get pretty, pretty huge in improvements in the single photon probability by adding a bunch of these time slots. And about at, at 20 time slots, we sort of start to saturate at over 60% probability, which is great because we start out way down here at about 7%. So huge improvement in the probability of emitting a single photon. Um, but the downside of this is you significantly decrease the rate of emission, um, the, the rate that you're getting this consistent photon out because the more time bins you dedicate to shuffling around, the less time bins you have for emitting the photons at the end. Uh, so th there is a trade-off of this, uh, but it is a good way to, to convert a non-deterministic non source into a pseudo-deterministic source. Um, so one app, another application of this is MDIQKD. Um, Shang Feng just gave a, a great tutorial about MDIQKD, so hopefully this is, this is fresh in your brains, but um, on one of his slides he mentioned that you have to have really precise control over uh, the, the time difference between the arrival of these photons. So synchronization is an incredibly important for MDI-QKD and all, all, all QKD schemes. Um, so our cyclical memory technology is an ideal candidate for, for demonstrating this in the lab uh, with a uh, non-deterministic source. So uh, this plot shows the enhancement in the coincidence rate from, from two different sources. We have source and a down conversion source. So Alice and Bob effectively sending their photons at and towards Charlie, who has a quantum memory device to, to perform synchronization of these random photons that are coming from uh, Alice and Bob. And after this synchronization, he performs a bell state measurement. So he sends them into to do coincidence. And again, you see that as we increase the, uh, the number of time bins we're multiplexing, so the number of storage cycles, we get pretty significant enhancement in our coincidence rate. Um, and this shows the... Uh, the, the Hongo Mandel dip, the, the, basically this shows the indistinguishability of the photons coming in. So uh, we have very high visibility, uh, which means that we are able to reliably, reliably uh, synchronize these photons and, and, and have them be incident into this Bell state measurement at the same time using this, uh, this quantum memory technology for synchronization purposes. And this uh, shows, shows the enhancement uh, in terms of counts. So uh, we get roughly a 30 times enhancement in our coincidence rate by using this synchronization. Uh, and this led to a 0.851 bit per key, uh, or per bit per second key rate. Um, and this was the first demonstration of uh, SPDC-based MDI-QKD. Um, so using this, using this synchronization uh, allowed for this to happen. And without the synchronization, we were actually unable to get any type of key rate just because there was not near enough coincidence rates. And you can see, um, with synchronization, the counts are shown here in the dark blue, and actually without synchronization is way down here in this light blue, and it's sort of blown up here so you can actually see it, but it is uh, not enough to really get any useful information out of it. Um, so all I've talked about so far is time multiplexing and, and how great it can be. Uh, you're mapping in pulses to a single output. Um, you, you only have a, a single source and a single loop, so it's easy to implement, uh, but this does decrease the transmission by the end. And uh, note that this is greater than a single pass through our switch. So storing for 100, over 100 nanoseconds is more efficient than going through our optical switch a single time. So we get a, a really great uh, efficiency out of this, uh, a storage time efficiency out of this, but at the cost of a poor time resolution because we can only emit our photon after it finishes traversing this cavity. We can't, we can't pick it off in the middle. It's not a, uh, it, it has to finish traversing the, the cell before we can uh, switch it out. 
uh, we can do even better than a Harriet cell. There's a whole class of, of storage multi-pass reflecting cavities that I'll just call modified Harriet cells because Harriet cell was the first one. Uh, but for example, we have something in our lab called a Robert cell where effectively you take a Harriet cell, cut one of the mirrors in half, and you can rotate uh, the two halves about uh, a common vertical axis. And this, this unlocks a whole uh, other solution space where um, you can achieve much greater path lengths. Uh, so for, for, the same, for the same length of cavity, roughly. And uh, just like the Harriet cell, these modified Harriet cells have a huge solution space, which is what I have plotted here. Every single dot represents a configuration of this modified Harriet cell to give you a different storage time. And our solution is right there in red, just as an example. Um, so, uh, right, since by, by doing this, this cutting in half and, and slightly twisting one of the mirrors, uh, we no longer have just a simple elliptical pattern. We actually have this sort of stacked elliptical pattern, which you can see here in this, in this little graphic. Uh, we have these ellipses that are spiraling in on each other, um, and then they unspiral. And th this shows reflections as they happen, uh, not necessarily at the speed of light, but slow down a little bit, um, just to give you an idea of what's actually happening through this, this system. And uh, the way it works is the light enters right below, just below this, this corner of the mirror, and it exits just above. So it enters at this dot and it exits right up there after finishing this, this uh, spiraling through it. Um, and just as another example of, of the performance this can provide, we have roughly on the order of 500 reflections in, the, in this cavity. And again, with the same 99.99% reflectivity gives us 95.1% uh, transmission for almost two microseconds of storage time, which uh, again is, is orders of magnitude greater than uh, our 12.5 nanosecond loop with pretty, pretty competitive efficiencies. Uh, again, uh, we have poor time resolution because once the, the photon is in this cavity, we have to wait until it's done traversing it to switch it out. So there is no, there is no single cavity that can be optimal for both storage time and time resolution. So the solution to this is to stitch them together, make a digital, digital memory where we have the three of them in series um, so we can, we can achieve an optimal balance in storage time and time resolution by using the three of these. We can use the, the longer, the longer uh, storage loop to eat up the vast majority of our storage time and then use the short and medium loops to get to the specific storage time that we're, we're looking for. Um, and just as a, a scenario of, of why this is beneficial, consider a user that wants to store the, their photon for 537 times the minimum time base of 12.5 nanoseconds. So uh, without multiplexing, what you have to do is you have to go through, without, without the three loops, uh, what you have to do is you have to go through this loop 537 times um, because that's the only way to get to, to this specific storage time. And uh, that's pretty, pretty inefficient because you have 99% transmission of the switch plus the uh, maybe roughly five reflections to the power of 537. So you're left with 0.3% of your light by the end, which is effectively nothing. Um, on the flip side, if we use the three loops to get this same 537 times the base, uh, with multiplexing, we have five times in the long loop, three times in the medium, and seven times through the short. Uh, and and uh, going through the same algebra we did for this, we have five reflections, 50 reflections, 500 the power of five, three, and seven, and we're left with 65% transmission at the end, which is much greater than, than the non-multiplexing case. So by uh, having this, this sort of uh, several storage loops and this digital approach gives you a huge enhancement in the uh, storage efficiency and the, the probability of emitting this photon at the end. Okay, um, I guess any questions right now? Great. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, 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 the metrics of our memory, the performance of it, and how it compares to other state-of-the-art technologies out there with, with the, the matter-based memories. Um, so currently, our system is acting as a true quantum memory storing uh, single photon states. We produce these states using down conversion, as I mentioned earlier. So we have a 355 nanometer pump photon that converts into two 710 nanometer photons. And uh, basically, one of, them, one of them is detected and tells the computer, hey, you have a photon coming, get ready. So then we can, uh, the, the user can tell the computer how long it wants to store the photon and it'll send the photon through each of the storage loops for the correct amount of times. And we can store the photon in each of these loops an arbitrary number of times. Although it only makes sense to store for up to nine times in the short and medium loop because it'd be more efficient to do one time in the next longer loop. But either way, we can store as many times as we want in each of these loops. Uh, just to show that we have this plot on the right-hand side, which is actually older data, so it's, it 
the efficiency is worse than we currently have, but it, it does a great job of showing uh, the full space. So this is showing the efficiency as a function of storage time for every single permutation of uh, number of cycles in each of the loops. So we can use the longer loop to get to close roughly where we need to store and then use the short medium loop to get to whatever specific multiple of 12.5 nanoseconds we want. And this is really the great thing of, of, of this technology is we have complete configurability. We can choose any specific 12.5 nanosecond time bin we want to uh, store in. And this is where fiber delays become intractable. If you want to have a configurable storage time, then um, you have to have fiber optic switches in your, in your uh, fiber network or, or whatever you're working with. And uh, some of the best fiber switches have at least 13% loss in them. Uh, it can be much more, and this is per switch. So whereas ours has roughly 1% loss every time you go through this switch, fibers have greater than 13%. So it really becomes intractable to have a uh, configurable fiber memory. Um, so this is just the efficiency of each of the storage loops separate, just so you can see them and treat them as uh, individual individual memories. Uh, so like I said, that we have mirrors with reflectivity greater than four nines, and this is really what enables us to have any type of competitive storage time, um, along with the, our relatively efficient switch, but it's the, mostly, the, mostly the mirrors that, that are great. And you can see in each of these plots, this is the 12.5, 125, and 1.25 microsecond uh, storage time uh, memories, and we, we plot the efficiency as a function of storage time. In blue, we have the actual data uh, that we, we've collected. Uh, and this is, just as a note, end-to-end -end efficiency. This is a, a one important metric. Um, so this is fiber to fiber, uh, which into single mode fiber. Um, so the, the, the pure storage efficiency would be uh, better by a little bit. And this is because our, the best coupling efficiency I've gotten so far is 80%. And this can be fine-tuned relatively significantly, um, but 80% was sufficient for, for my purposes. Um, so the blue shows our data, red shows the fit to this data, and green shows what we expect to have based on our mirror reflectivities and our optic transmissions, et cetera. Uh, so we're not quite where we want to be, um, and I think this is due to spatial mode mismatching, uh, just, just to explain what I mean by that. So you take any laser pointer, you point it far enough away, it will expand a lot. So the spatial mode is diverging. Um, same thing in this, this is a free space memory. We are traveling greater than 10 kilometers, so your light, your, your spatial mode will diverge a fair amount. So in each of these loops, we have to have very judicious uh, choice and placement of lenses or, or focusing optics to fix this spatial mode. Um, and any mismatch in this can be pretty detrimental to your overall storage time. And uh, we haven't quite perfected that yet. So that, that is um, the improvements that we are looking to make in, in the near future to drag, drag all these lines up closer to this green line to get a little bit more competitive. Um, so one thing about this memory is we switch into and out of all of our storage loops by using a polarization switch, which makes the entire memory polarization dependent, which means it can only store a single polarization, which makes it useless as a quantum memory. And the way we get around this is by having a polarization to time bin transducer. Um, so this takes an arbitrary polarization state here at the left. Uh, it comes in traveling to the right. And this is a unbalanced polarization interferometer. So Horizontal light will transmit, vertical light will reflect and take a longer path. So now you, you split your pulse into two time bins that are at different polarizations. Um, and then this Pockel cell rotates the polarization of just one of the components so that they are the same polarization separated uh, by a time. And they are now a time bin qubit. And both of these time bin states go into the, the memory. All operations happen equally because they're the same polarization. And then when we're done storing, they travel backwards to the transducer, stitch the polarization back together, and restore the initial polarization state. And we've demonstrated that this has a uh, process, uh, or we, through process tomography, we've demonstrated this has a state fidelity of 99.12%. So effectively, it's perfectly preserving the state of our photon. Um, and furthermore, we have demonstrated or performed process tomographies on each of the storage loops uh, in our memory just to show that it is effectively. Uh, preserving the, the quantum information that we are encoding into our, our photons. And this is important because um, a lot of matter-based memories, specifically, the longer you store, the worse their uh, fidelity is. So their fidelity decreases relatively significantly as they're storing because noise, noise is added into their system. But um, most, of, most of our operations are light having a almost zero angle of incidence reflection. Uh, and doing that changes your polarization, does not change your polarization state at all. So it effectively perfectly preserves the 
the, the polarization of your system. Um, so another, another key metric that I talked about earlier is the bandwidth. Uh, this is great. Bulk, bulk, bulk optics are really great um, for this purpose. Uh, current state-of-the-art uh, optics, such as our mirrors, uh, work really well for a super broad wavelength range. For example, this plot shows the uh, reflectance of our mirrors in red uh, as a function of wavelength. And you can see this is uh, plus or minus 15 nanometers, 20 nanometers from the center wavelength for a greater than 99.99% reflectivity, so extremely broadband. Uh, and likewise, on the same plot, we have the Pockel cell switching probability because Pockel cell, uh, right, it's a, it, it's, it's a, a wave plate and um, the exact wavelength of the light switching that you're switching uh, affects how much phase it, it uh, receives. So it does have a finite bandwidth, but again, it's a relatively broad bandwidth uh, for these Pockel cells. So some, some calculations shown that a single reflection off of our mirrors have a full width half max bandwidth of 22 terahertz for the mirrors and a single Pockel cell polarization rotation has a uh, bandwidth of 420 terahertz. And for the full storage, nine, nine times through each of our storage cycles, uh, our storage loops, uh, to, to achieve a 12.5 microsecond storage time, we have a 23 terahertz bandwidth. Uh, and another key metric to judge a memory by is not just its bandwidth, but its time bandwidth product. The bandwidth of it multiplied by the storage time. Because if you have an ultra broad bandwidth, you can store ultra short pulses. If you have a really long storage time, you can cram a lot of these pulses into the system and you can really increase your, your communication rates. So the time bandwidth product sort of gives an indication of how, uh, how fast your, your network can run, I guess. So our time bandwidth product is roughly order 10 to the eight, uh, which, is, which is orders of magnitude greater than competing technologies. Just to show this, um, this is a plot from this archive paper uh, that shows the memory lifetime as a function of bandwidth for a lot of different memory technologies. And um, all, all of these different memory technologies, except the bottom two, are different types of atomic memories, different types of matter memories. And you can see that uh, they all have really low bandwidth on the order of megahertz to, to single gigahertz or 10 gigahertz usually. Um, and we have similar memory lifetimes to all of them as well. And also just to outline the time bandwidth product this line represents a time bandwidth product of one, and as you go outward, the time bandwidth product increases. So all of the all the matter-based memories are effectively between one and a thousand, whereas we're at roughly ten to the eight out here. So orders of magnitude better than any any other competing technology scheme out there. Um, and here is a qualitative comparison of the different types of memories out there. Um, so atomic memories do have really one one incredible strength i guess two incredible strengths in my opinion uh one their storage time can be incredibly long people have demonstrated storage for hours in in different uh, matter-based memories and if you truly need hours of memory uh hours of storage time then atomic memories are truly the only way to go um and also they are really great because they are push button get photon out once you're done storing it's it's arbitrary storage time you can you can just emit it whenever you want to so they have uh, great storage time and they're very configurable, but all the downsides are their bandwidth is super low. Their time bandwidth product is very low. Their operating wavelength is typically in the near infrared and we want telecom bandwidth or, or telecom photons. So they have a, an extra lossy uh, frequency conversion step that they have to do. There's high noise and they, op they operate at extreme temperatures. And um, Similarly, fiber, fiber delays have some benefits, but again, they, they are not configurable and they're not quite as robust as uh, free space storage. So uh, you see here in this bottom, uh, this bottom row, all the, all the perks of using a, a free space memory for a lot of quantum communication purposes, uh, you only really need something on the order of 100 microseconds. So that, I feel this fits very well into the, the need of this space. Okay, so now I'm just gonna give a, uh, Brief summary and an outlook, looking forward. So all the things I've talked about so far, just quantum networks and uh, how they benefit from memories, um, that you can really get pretty good improvements in emission of single photon probability and synchronization of photons for different protocols in these networks. Um, we've talked about this single loop scheme and, and all the applications of it, even though it's a small system and how, how many benefits you can get from it. We've talked about the longer memories that we have in our our system and how you can multiplex these together to get, uh, again, really great benefits and performance. 
um, and, and shown just how, how competitive this technology is compared to uh, what most people in the, in the field look at with these matter-based memories. Um, so there is room to grow, as, as I talked about a little bit before. Um, we, can, we can improve the spatial mode of our, uh, of our loops, the, the spatial mode matching of our loops to drag up the efficiency. And also, one of the biggest upgrades we could make is, even though we, we have really great mirrors with 99.99% reflectivity, there are mirrors with another nine tacked on, and that would significantly improve the, the efficiency of our longer storage loops, uh, pushing us into and past the 100 microsecond uh, storage time regime. And additionally, the system is pretty large. You can see me here over the system with a bunch of dramatic lights. It's on a roughly four foot by six foot optical table. And um, ideally, we would like this to be smaller. And because these, uh, these, these free space delays have such a huge solution space, you can really configure it to have a, a high storage density, I guess I would call it. A, lot, a long storage time for a compact system. And you can also do a lot of optical engineering to really make this, this system more compact and make it uh, deployable into different quantum network systems. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank my, my advisor, Paul Quiot, for, for hosting me. Uh, we're always looking for more scientists, more people to, to come to our lab, join our group, to tour our, tour our facilities. So if you are interested, this could be you, adding a bow tie into your, your collection. Uh, so you can contact me at my email here, or you can contact Paul if you're interested in, in our group down there. And I'll take any questions now. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, uh, thank you for the great talk and uh, the fascinating performance, especially the, the high efficiencies. Um, I see that you already showed the, the very high um, time bandwidth product. Um, my question would be, um, have you run like uh, temporal multi-mode storage experiments uh, already? Or can you comment on that maybe? And my second question would be um, about the miniaturization of the system. Is there any effort to push this to like space compatible quantum memories at some point? Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. So for the first question, do you mean um, like uh, multiplexing, multiplexing storage loops to sort of create exotic states like noon states or things like that? Is that where you're? So for now, just uh, having like uh, pulse trains for like uh, oh. multiple temporal modes. Great, yeah. Um, there, is, there is work on that happening right now. Um, yeah, I guess what I, what I could say is we are, uh, yes, we are working on, it, on a system with this short loop to take, take an output that is, let's say, at a, a megahertz and take a lot of those and compress them into a uh, 100 megahertz or gigahertz rate. Uh, train of photons, train of four, five, six, how many photons coming out to, um, right, to, to produce a faster, a faster system. And what you can do with that is you, you can multiplex them in space. So you have several of these systems firing. This one fires, this one fires, this one fires. And then while these are firing, the other ones are loading up their next train. So you can have a continuous, uh, continuous stream. And we are, we are working on developing one of those systems right now. And the, the second question, um, yes, yeah, so there are efforts currently going on. We actually just received some funding from the university to push towards uh, compactifying the system. Uh, and we're, we're looking at a lot of uh, ways that we could make this scalable. Uh, our first goal would be uh, something that can just fit in a network rack, so 19 inches wide by a, a couple feet deep. Um, and there's, there's promise, certainly, with uh, how much we can compactify these, uh, these long store, these long cavities. Um, so yeah, there, there is active work going on in that. And as far as space, um, I think that is possible. Uh, but first, I guess I would like to have it be able to work in a, net, a network room before I send it off on a, on a space to, and not need grad students to spend five hours aligning it every time. But uh, I think possible. With, with enough active alignment, I think possible. All right, thank you. With the approach that you're talking about and the um, metric that you're using, do you envision um, a future or present um, in which the quantum communications networks that would develop, be developed out of this would be superior in any way to optical communications? Uh, what do you mean by optical communications? So when I think about laser communications like NASA's LCRD, the laser communication relay demonstration and the like, I'm trying to do a comparison or at least understand how quantum could improve um, capability beyond where it is today. Um, 
That's a good question. I guess not. Um, so then the NASA system you're talking about, is that in fiber or is that in free space? That's um, actually deployed in space currently. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, so um, we're, all, we're also doing work on uh, ground to satellite quantum communication. Uh, for example, this has been done for a while. Uh, Michius a few years ago did, did ground to satellite QKD. And there, there are, um, actually, I guess I would say that scheme is possibly trying to get around what I'm doing. So. Um, if you if you want to, if you say communicating on ground is too lossy, um, just just get rid of all all the the ground station, all all the repeater nodes. Send it up to a satellite so you can do really long distance uh, quantum communication. I would say that would probably, if it, if it was cost effective enough and scalable enough, scalable enough, that would probably um, try to wipe out what I'm trying to do. But I think um, at the same time, again, like 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 uh, the previous question just asked. Uh, you, so you still need memories for a lot of synchronization purposes. So maybe putting a, a memory node on a space station to do this type of synchronization, uh, depending on on how long the storage time is, because that's kind of far away. But um, yeah, I think I think it could enable improvements for a lot of uh, the the ground to satellite communication protocols. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. So my question is probably about. Uh, well, two questions. So the first one you mentioned about how you have to use these lens configurations in order to make sure, I guess, the expanding beam doesn't get like out of control. Um, so do you use a lens inside the loop to kind of just constantly expand and then, uh, I guess, refocus the beam? Yes, uh, exactly. That's that's exactly what we do. We have uh, how far how far it is. Uh, we have at the end of each uh, at the end of each loop. So not shown is basically right. Right at the, at, at the output of each of these cavities and right in the middle of this, we have just a simple 4F imaging system. So just uh, lens directly into lens just to fix the spatial mode and then make it uh, identical to when it entered that previous cycle. So um, yeah, just, just making sure that it's the same. A pretty, sim pretty simple approach, hard to do in practice. But. Oh, yeah, that's very cool. And sorry, my second question, if I can, is uh, so at the moment, this is working at 7, 10 nanometers. Um, can this sort of be mapped to 1550 so that it would be usable at telecom wavelengths? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so so I guess we did 710 because one of those projects was started 10 years ago. They did 7, oh, because it matches our, our, our down conversion source. Um, but yeah, we actually have several of these systems operating at 1550, 1590. Um, and yeah, certainly, the, actually I would say the great thing about bulk optics is um, those plots I showed for the reflectivity actually get broader at the telecom. So this is maybe, this is maybe 40 nanometers uh, across right there, and it's roughly 90 nanometers at 1550. So extremely broad band, everything happens the exact same. Um, the only hard part is aligning it because you can't see. But yes, yeah, certainly possible, and we're, we're actually working on some things with that now. Okay, so we'll take one last question. Hello, thank you for, for the inter <coughs> interesting talk. Um, I had a qu not question just uh, to understand. Uh, the way I, I understand is that uh, quantum dots cannot be pumped more than like 200 megahertz because of their temporal profile, while uh, SPDC inherits from the pumping uh, temporal profile. So if Practically, you can uh, pump it to gigahertz regime. I personally did it to 10. Um, but uh, this uh, scheme is uh, limited because of the, uh, the pockets to 80 megahertz. How does it fare against the lithium niobate uh, buffers that has like 10% loss per, uh, per round, but yet again, you can uh, run it in, t in, t in the gigahertz regime? And the second question is a little bit technical. Uh, so, it, so the way I understand your setup is that you should wait for the idler to uh, to trigger uh, an SNSPD with this uh, uh, single photon detector with its uh, detection efficiency, and then send back the signal. You analyze it. The FPGA triggers the packet set to to start the loop. How how do you like? Uh, did you consider the uh, and me, in the meanwhile you have to hold the other photon in a I assume a fiber loop. Did you consider that, or how did you uh, how did you find a way to to go around this uh, this this waiting time or this uh, overhead? Uh, Thank you. Right. Yeah. So I'll I'll answer the second question first because it's easier. Um, yeah. So right now we just have a simple fiber that's 90 meters, and, and yeah, 
we're using a fiber memory to input into our free space memory effectively. Um, but I think to, to have an even higher, what, one thing we certainly could do is just add a, another Harriet cell uh, to store for that, that amount of time. We've, we've calculated that it's roughly 100, 100 nanos, 150 nanoseconds we have to store. That, that's how much latency we have. So um, with, with faster electronics, that'll come down, and uh, that's relatively easy to do, get that storage time with a Harriet cell. So uh, either a free space, uh, a free space memory added just for that, that buffer or fiber delay is pretty simple. Uh, for your other question about the rep rate, you are very correct that the, the rep rate of Pockel cells is severely limited. Bulk, bulk crystals, you're, you're applying like five kilovolts to the system and it's hard to do that fast. Um, how it compares to something like a lithium niobate, uh, I don't know the specific details of lithium niobate, but you mentioned 10% loss per, per cycle. Um, depending on how much storage time you can get out of something like that, 10% is relatively high loss to have to accept every single time. If it's a short storage time, then that's kind of uh, very that, the, the same thing as the fiber delay. 13% loss every cycle is uh, a non-starter. So depending on the storage time, 10% loss might be a non-starter. But um, so the fix to that is either uh, smaller Pockel cells, which which we are looking into to drive your rates up to maybe maybe hundreds of megahertz. Um, we're also working on some all optical switching, so Kerr effect instead of Pockel's effect. So switching in fiber, which can happen at 30 gigahertz. Um, or spatial multiplexing, so you, like I mentioned earlier, just have multiple of these things firing to, and while one is firing, the other is loading up kind of thing. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again.